morning, everyone. We have been covering the book of Daniel, and one of the things about the book of Daniel, if you get nothing else out of it when you read through it, it definitely talks a lot about dreams. Lots about dreams. It's very interesting because what we see in Daniel is that God was using Daniel and his uh, friends who were brought in from Babylon, I mean, into Babylon from uh, being conquered in Israel. He was bringing them in and using them to reveal himself in some very different ways. And up until this point, a lot of people hadn't seen God reveal himself in this way. And so Daniel is known uh, one of the things that was kind of his uh, hallmark was he was known as a person who could interpret dreams. He was known as one who could identify people's dreams and help them make sense of these dreams. And what I, one of the things I want to look at today is not just, you know, kind of matter of factly, well, this is the dreams that came up and these things that Daniel interpreted, but how is it that something like that can be applicable to us today? What is it about Daniel being able to reveal and interpret these dreams that matters to us today? Because sometimes we can look, especially when we go through the Old Testament, read about somebody like Daniel, and we think, well, that's great. Wow, that's amazing. That power that was used you know, how, how they channeled, you know, the Holy Spirit, how they were able to do these amazing, wonderful things. And sometimes we can lose sight of the fact that actually that's not just a story for us to look at and kind of marvel at and, and think that's great. But there's always something that's applicable in there for us. There's something useful in there for us to get from it. But as is all the things that we read in the Bible, it requires us to have faith. It requires us to actually believe that God can use us the same way that he used these other men and women that we read about in the Bible. So as we read through this, I want us to really consider and kind of put ourselves in the story, if you will. I'm going to do this, and I've been doing a little bit backwards, where we're kind of going backwards in time. And the reason why is because when we saw, when we first started this, when we saw Daniel in the lion's den, you know, we see this man who, you know, was well into his 80s, we believe, and, and we saw his courage and his bravery. But the reason why we started there and I've been going backwards is that progressively, I want us to see how that aged, you know, well past his prime, we might call it man, how he was so faithful and so bold, but it came from so many other experiences that built his faith. And I want us to see how our faith can be and should be built in such a way that as we age, that we become stronger in our faith, not complacent, not weaker, not more doubtful and, and more, you know, on the fence, but that we should be bold in our faith, just like we see Daniel. So I want to look at Daniel and how God used him to interpret dreams. And I wanted to, I want us to find a way to apply that to our own lives. The title of the sermon today is The Impossible Dream. And I borrowed this title from a, a song, one of my favorite songs. The Impossible Dream. It was written by this guy. Probably don't know him. Most people don't. His name was Mitch Lay. Mitch Lay. Now, Mitch Lay was actually a uh, writer. He did music. He was very um, intelligent man. He he had a lot of accomplishments, but he was very unknown. Uh, most of what he accomplished and most of what he ended up doing, nobody <laughs> knew about it until there was this play that he was asked to uh, write and put together the music for. It's called Man of La Mancha. Man of La Mancha, I won't get into the storyline. It's kind of a, a comedy 
um, that was written about this guy who was in prison, and so they did this mock trial and everything. And um, you know, it's interesting. But the song, the the song that everybody remembers from this play was the Impossible Dream, to the point where literally there have been dozens, like, of artists who have covered this song, The Impossible Dream. Everybody from Frank Sinatra to Luther Vandross, Roberta Flack, you name it, people have read it, they've redone. You know, they've, they've covered this song. And it's interesting, the reason why I bring that up is because very often when we read about people like Daniel in the Bible, we see kind of these flashpoint moments, these big things that happen, and we can kind of forget that, you know, there's a lot of other things that may have come along to build their faith all along the way. And, but it's kind of like Sports Center, right? All we kind of get is the highlights. You know, all we see is, you know, a three hour long game be condensed into like a minute. And we see all the big plays and the big calls that happen. And that's kind of what happened to this man, Mitch Lay. When we read about Daniel, though, I want us to really consider, and again, apply it to ourselves. How is it that he got to the point that he did? How did his faith grow to a point that when this big flashpoint, this big moment happened, that he was ready? Because very often, it's just like us. We go throughout our day, throughout the week, months, even years. And then that big moment happens, and our faith is required. It is tested. It's required that we stand up. And people will look at the highlight. They will look at that moment and think, wow, that was amazing. That was brave. That was courageous. That was so <laughs> faithful. But it was all the things along the way that brought us to that point. I want to start in Daniel chapter 2. We'll see here. And I'll set this up for everybody, starting in verse 1. It says, in the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream." And we will interpret it. This is where it gets kind of interesting. The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more, they replied, let the king tell his servants a dream and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then tell me the dream and I will know that you can interpret it for me. The astrologers answered the king, there is no one on earth who can do what the king asked. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asked is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. You know, it's interesting because we, we see the scenario, we see the setup here where Nebuchadnezzar is giving them something that's quite impossible to do. That's what they decided. It was impossible for them to be able to tell him what was on his mind. What, like, Nebuchadnezzar, do we live in your head? Do we actually know what you were dreaming? He says, 
if you're truly able to do what you say that you can do, then it wouldn't be impossible for you. If you actually can have this great wisdom and insight and, you know, you guys are these magicians, then it wouldn't be impossible. And we can look at this and think, wow, that's kind of unfair, Nebuchadnezzar. That's, that's you know, very harsh, and it is. But sometimes we can overlook the fact that he gathered all the wise men and all these magicians and all these people who claimed that they could interpret these dreams. And notice they didn't even invite poor Daniel and his friends. It wasn't like they were a part of it. And see, this became a thing. We looked at this even last week when we were looking, you know, as time went on. And there was another situation similar to this where they weren't even called. You know, sometimes we can be thrust into situations where it just doesn't seem fair. You know, I have to pay the price for what somebody else did. I have to be held accountable. See, they're going to put, that, you know, it says here, you know, they went and sent men to look for Daniel and his friends and put them to death. You, said, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Benigo, these are teenagers at this point. They're saying, what do we have to do with it? You know, you came and plucked us from our home and fed us and taught us for three years all this information and, and you've indoctrinated us. You, you're wanting us to be a part of your culture. And you didn't even ask us. You didn't even give us the benefit of being able to say whether or not we can interpret your dream. It's very unfair, not only what Nebuchadnezzar did, but even how... Daniel and his friends were treated. And sometimes we can be in that place where we feel like circumstances, I just can't seem to catch a break. It just doesn't seem to be working out for me. I'm not getting the benefit of the doubt. And we can focus so much on that that we can forget that no matter how impossible it seems, no matter how unfair it seems, no matter how difficult our life circumstances are, God always has room to get glory when we have faith in him. We see here that the odds were clearly stacked against them, but God puts the odds in our favor to glorify him, even when we don't understand how or why certain things are being done. You know, sometimes it is the most difficult to have faith when you're looking at what's in front of you. I've got this totally irrational, mad, insane ruler who's being harsh to everybody, and I don't even have the cooperation of my peers or my coworkers or those who I'm supposed to be working with. So they were isolated on top of these unfair circumstances. You know, and I want to talk about this because, you know, we think about teamwork. Very often we think about teamwork, and I don't know what comes to mind for you, but I played a lot of team sports. You know, I, you know, it's like it doesn't matter what you think of your individual talent or your ability. When it comes to working as a team, everybody has to do their part. Everybody is important, right? And, you know, I bring this up in this context because, Daniel, in this situation, you know, he's just minding his business, I'm sure, reading or eating whatever whatever he's doing. And, you know, the man just knocks on the door and says, it's time to go. We're going to chop you up into pieces, right? You're thinking, for what? What happened? That's a very isolated place to be. You can feel very alone. And yet, when we think about the church, what the church is for each one of us. Do we think of the church as a place for us to go and get something for us as the individual? And then we go back to our isolated lives, our isolated situations, or do we realize that this is the team that God has given us? That that team matters. That we don't just have meetings and just have functions and have, you know, things where we gather for fellowship or things that we do in a community for service or we have our little Bible study groups. We don't just do this just to have something to put on the calendar, but that this teamwork is designed for us very often to be reminded 
of God, to be able to see God more clearly. This is a uh, poem um, from a book by John Dene, I believe is how you pronounce it. Sorry, I don't know. But very familiar with this. It says, no man is an island. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the man. If a cloud be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or of thine own work. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never sin to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Some of us probably read this in high school or something. You familiar with this, Andrew? Andrew didn't get it. Okay, Dennis got it. Dennis had to read this back in high school. Andrew, hey man, look, the state of public education. But <laughs> the, point, <laughs> the point is that this poem, what is it saying? What is it pointing out? It's pointing out that very often we can look at our situation. Daniel in that moment could have very easily felt, woe is me. Why is this happening to me? I feel alone. And we forget that when, the reason why we're here, the reason why we gather as Christians is because of what? Because of the fact that Christ died for the church. He died for this unity that we are to have, that we are to go out and reflect the love of Christ. And what we're about to see is not only did Daniel understand that he was able to interpret the dream, but it's what he did before he attempted to interpret the dream that matters to us so much. Let's continue looking at uh, Daniel chapter 2. We'll stay here for the rest of the time. But in verse 14, it says, When Ariok, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, Why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Ariok then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Also, we know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He urged them to plead for mercy from God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness, and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we ask of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Prior to this incident, Daniel was well aware that he had this gift. And it's no different than any other gift that we get from God. Some of us are gifted in different areas than others of us. We are completely shallow in it, right? It's like we don't even try because we know that's just not our gift. And this was his gift. But even though Daniel understood that he had the gift to be able to interpret dreams, what matters so much is that he understood that it was still something that had to be given to God. Not only did he understand it had to be given to God, but he didn't just go and pray on his own. He understood the power of that intercessory prayer that 
He went to his brothers, he went to his friends, and he asked them to pray as well. Why? Because even with his gifts, even with his talents, even with the many things that we may be gifted in, we still have to take it to God. And not only do we have to take it to God, we have to be united in such a way that we pray for each other. That we're willing to be specific. That when we're troubled, we don't just rely on our own strength and our own discernment and our own understanding, but we take it to others and we say, brother, sister, this is the situation. This is what's going on. Our God is faithful, and I know our God is faithful, but pray with me through this. See, no man is an island. No Christian goes out here and battles on their own. Yeah, you may be the only person who's a Christian at your job. You may be the only person in your neighborhood who truly desires to chase after the life of Christ, but that doesn't mean that you're alone. Daniel went and faced the king alone. He went and talked to the king and made his plea by himself, but he also understood that his friends were praying for him the whole time. They were going to God as well. Even with our gifts from God, it's imperative to go to God for discernment and using them. And not only is it imperative that we go to God in discernment on how we use them and when we use them, how far we go, how, how far we take them, but it's also equally important that we share it with others. That we ask others to pray for us. See, very often we can be so disconnected. See, this moment was not just set up for Daniel to go and pray and to go ask God for the help and how to be able to discern it. See, he understood that his friends needed to also go to God as well because this did concern them. As a church, we have to understand that. We can't just struggle and go through things and be tested all alone when we have each other. We have to make ourselves available to one another to strengthen other people's faith. See, this didn't just remember, we talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We talked about, you know, the fiery furnace. But see, that's why we're going backwards, kind of in that Pulp Fiction kind of way. Well, we're seeing all of their faith later on in the book of Daniel, but it starts with this incident, this situation, and how now Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego see exactly how God delivered on being able to show Daniel and reveal this dream to him. So now when they go to the fiery furnace, this is why they're so unconcerned. This is why they're not faith. This is why they're not bothered by the threats of the king because they know that their God is going to deliver because they've seen him deliver before because they had first-hand access and exposure to God revealing that dream to Daniel. This is a psalm. I'll read it because it's not the best lighting. It says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You know, being threatened to be cut into multiple pieces, I don't care what era, what time you grew up in, that's always scary. And yet, we see, we read these psalms like this, and it talks about the Lord being our salvation, how he'll protect us. Uh, we have nothing to be afraid of, and yet we still encounter situations in our life that cause us to fear. But do we take it to God? Do we trust him so that we aren't afraid? Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. That's We, we always go back to this when we talk about faith, Hebrews 11, and that's the faith chapter, right? We read about what faith really is. We don't see the outside. We don't see the outcome. We don't see what's coming over the horizon. But we have faith that God is going to deliver. 
But what does that faith in action look like? And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Matthew 21. See, these boys, they didn't just, you know, keep in mind, it's important, I keep saying this, they were teenagers at this time. They weren't seasoned you know, adult men who've lived long lives and had family and have gone through a bunch. They were young men. They were teenagers plucked out of their own home, plucked out of their community, out of their culture. They were all that they had. And when we think about the faith that had to be built up into them, the faith that had to be established for them to go on and face the lion's den and face the fiery furnace and so many other things, a few we're going to look at next week. We realize that it's because they always took it to God. And they took it to God with one another. Nobody suffered alone with them. They were all in it together. As a church, are we in it together? Do we pray for one another as though your struggles, your concerns, the things that you want, the things that you need, the things that are on your heart, do we pray for it as though it's on my heart as well? Yesterday I was up in Newark with me and the kids. We went to go to this place called Launch. Uh, we went with a friend. It's kind of a play date. We went with some friends of mine, a friend of mine from the gym. He has three kids. We go up there. And as I'm driving and I get close to the place, my phone vibrates, I pull up in the parking lot and I look, and I get this message from Grandma Huffman. <laughs> we, we, we've been calling her Jim. She's Grandma Huffman now, right? Because she's got this new grandbaby. She says, hey, we're at the hospital and we're about to have a baby. Pray for us. Now here's the thing. In my mind, I'm thinking, you know what? This baby's going to be fine. I've been praying for this baby. I'm not worried about it. But the fact that she asked me to pray was more than just a request and a petition to pray because, oh, well, I'm concerned and I'm nervous and there's a lot of anxiety. Tom was telling me, he was like, man, it was rough. You know, just sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And you're just sitting out there waiting and waiting and waiting. It seems like, you know, it takes forever. But here's the thing. See, now that's my baby too. Now I'm praying for this child as well. It's not just the Huffman's grandchild. It's not just Andrew's, you know, is it a niece? niece? Thank you. <laughs> it's not just Andrew's niece. You know, this is, I don't know, what am I, uncle? So yeah, it's, it's my niece too now, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think, what is my relation to this baby? <laughs> yes, Uncle Billy is praying for the Huffman's grandchild. We as a family, we do these things together and we do it in faith because nobody's alone in this. When, when somebody loses somebody, they lose a sibling, they lose a mother, they lose a father, they lose a child, it's not just them losing. We're losing it together. We mourn together. We pray for one another. Do we have this unity that we see reflected in the lives of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? We'll finish it up here. And we'll um, read verse 24 through 28, and then we'll skip down to 45 through 49. This is pretty long. It says, Then Daniel went to Ariok, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. <laughs> Ariok took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. We we'll move forward. Verse 45. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. 
Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all his wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. We'll get in next week, we'll get into exactly what that dream was a little bit and kind of break that down, and it's significant. But what we see here is Daniel made it very clear at the outset. No man can do what you're asking them to do. It is impossible to do what you've asked us to do. Certain death would have come for all of them because Nebuchadnezzar clearly showed his willingness to kill people. Part of the reason why Nebuchadnezzar was considered so great, and we'll get into this when we look at the dream, the actual dream itself that's in between what we read there. He was a great warrior. He was strategic. He understood um, how to get things done when it came to expanding their territory and taking over nations. In fact, that's what happened to Israel. That's why God allowed him to come to power of Babylon was to humble God's people. But the point is that he was tormented by these dreams and Daniel tells him no man can do what you're asking but there's a God who can. I have faith in this God who can. You know, I think I've talked about this in the past where, you know, that, that saying where it's like, hey, uh, George, we talked about this a lot where, you know, growing up you think, well, didn't have a whole lot of money, and I don't know how mama made it. And, but somehow, God made that little bit of money that my mom or my dad earned. They, God made it enough. I don't know how this is going to work out, but God made it work out. Is that the God that you have faith in? Is that the God who you pray to? A God where enough it's never a question of whether he can. It's not even a question of whether he will. It's whether or not you believe he will. There are so many people who the concept of God may actually make sense for them. The concept, the theory makes sense, but their faith is not in this God. They don't actually believe Kind of like when they call God that he's going to actually pick up the phone. You know, my friend jokes with me. She says, you know, you have the, the red phone for Jesus. So like when you pray, like it's like the back phone. He knows, oh, okay, well, we've got to answer. See, the thing is, we look at Daniel. We look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We see how they pray. And sometimes we forget that's the exact same God who wants us to talk and communicate with him. The same God who answered that prayer that gave him the vision to be able to not only interpret what the dream meant, but tell him what the dream was, that same God exists. And he can work through your talent. He can work through your gifts and your skills and abilities, but do you go to him with it, with faith, that he actually is going to answer. It is God working through us that makes things possible that are thought to be impossible. We know that this amazing God created the whole universe and all these mysteries that we haven't even discovered yet. We haven't even come close to scratching the surface of the God of the universe and all the many things and many worlds that he's created. But that same God, do we limit him? Do we limit him by making things that are impossible for us also impossible for him? We know that God's not limited. I used this example, I believe, last week where, you know, my kids, you know, there's things that they can't lift 
because they're small, they're young, it's too heavy for them. They think of it as being impossible. When for me, it's not only not impossible, it's actually quite light, it's quite routine. The impossible things that we think of are actually very routine for God. But do we ask him? Do we pray in faith to him? God, this thing that seems impossible for me, I know you can lift it. I know you can move it. I know you can take it. I know you can handle it. Jennifer sending me that text about the baby. Guess what? The baby was fine. God knew that. But it required her to go in faith and say, pray so that this baby, baby will be healthy. Do we go to God with that level of faith? Do we bring it to others and say, help me with my faith. Pray with me. Pray for me. Let's pray together. Do we understand just how big God is and how there's nothing that's impossible for him? And that just like we saw there where Daniel's giving God the glory, when we do things that other people think of as impossible, see, it may be, you know, Nobody's going to walk up to us tomorrow when we get to our job and say, hey, can you tell me about this dream? Frankly, that's not our gift, and people don't do that. You know, people just walk up to the cubicle and be like, hey, you got two minutes? I had this dream. Can you interpret it for me? I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm going to chop you up at lunch. But, you know, that's not how it's going to work. But here's something that might happen. You know, somebody hurts you really badly, and they see how you're able to forgive. They see how you're able to overcome. And for them, it would be impossible to forgive that person. It would be impossible to still love that person because they don't understand who Christ is. See, for us, that has to be possible. And we have to understand, just like Daniel said, it's possible because God makes it possible. Because of Christ living in me, it is made possible. Do we have faith and serve that impossible God? Close it out here with a few questions. How often do I ask for others to pray in intercession for me, even when I'm sure that I can handle it on my own? We go through routine stuff all the time. We think, man, this bill, this is, you know, just another situation. Oh, the car broke down or Man, went to the doctor, found out this was wrong, or my mother's sick, or my dad's going through something. And we think of these things as routine, and we never consider that just because in our mind, and just because we've handled it in the past, that still doesn't change the fact that we ask others, that we go to others, not only for our faith, but for their faith as well. Somebody needs to see you be delivered. Somebody needs to see you get that victory for God for their faith. See, we can look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and we can see how Daniel and them being together and praying for one another and with one another, we can see how that spurred them on later on. The victory, the outcome of him being able to interpret his dream for Nebuchadnezzar clearly had an impact on them when it came to the fiery furnace and their faith in that God. But we have to bring each other in. How often do we do that? Even for the things that seem routine. Seems kind of, you know, be mundane or normal. How often do we ask others to pray for us? Does my faith in God waver when I feel that life is not fair? Do I seek to know God's plan before I doubt that he is in control? You know, Daniel was sitting there and he's facing certain death, and man just shows up one day at the door and says, hey, I'm going to chop you into pieces. Let's go. I mean, that's the perfect time to go, woe is me, right? Perfect time to have that pity party. Perfect time to start thinking, where is God in this situation? Is he even there? Is he out of, you know, is he even in control? Or is he like, you know, out for lunch? Why is God sending me to voicemail? See, sometimes those thoughts can creep up in our mind because we forget 
that actually what you're dealing with and what you're going through is a part of God's plan, not just for you, but for others around you, others watching you, others involved in your life. They have to see your faith as well. And we can't waver and doubt when it comes to our faith in God because we feel like the current circumstance we're in is not fair. Do I understand my purpose in life within the context of God receiving the glory? Do I measure my success by my accolades and accomplishments or how much people see God through me? You know, I bring this up because there's a pattern here in the book of Daniel that we see. Clearly Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, clearly they stood out. They were clearly the wisest and the smartest, you know, the most discerning, the most intelligent. Daniel went on to have, you know, in the, the three Hebrew boys, they went on to have an amazing, accomplished career, if you will, serving the king, the multiple kings that they served. And yet, we see where they weren't even included when Nebuchadnezzar wanted to know what his dream meant. They were constantly being looked over, constantly being slighted, if you will. Constantly in a situation where they just were not being treated as though they mattered. Very often, we can forget that our life matters in the context of how it's going to give God glory. It's not about what the world thinks of us and whether or not other people consider us great, consider us significant. What matters is that what we do and how we live and how we submit our lives to God, how we live is in such a way that God always gets the glory. God puts us strategically in places like we see here with Daniel. He strategically puts us in places to give him glory. And if we're always looking at how can my life, how can my purpose be to give him glory, suddenly it doesn't matter if you get that promotion or not. Suddenly it doesn't matter if you like your neighbors or not. Suddenly it doesn't matter if you have as much money as you want or if things are tighter than you like them to be because all that really matters is, is God getting the glory. We see that ultimately, Daniel, and this would happen, this would be a, a cycle, this would be a pattern here, where when Daniel allowed God to work in him and God came through and gave the victory, then all the, you know, all the, they lavished him with a bunch of stuff and gave him all these things and gave him promotions. But even that did not define Daniel's work. It wasn't the size of his house. It wasn't how much money he had. It wasn't how important people considered him. It was defined by him giving God glory. And finally, do I fundamentally believe that God has a bigger plan for me than what the world can offer or even quantify? We read through Daniel. We see these examples and these amazing things were done. Like I said, the same God those thousands of years ago is the same God that wants to work and use you. But we have to ask ourselves, do we believe that? See, back then, Daniel was known because he was a governor of this province and he was over in charge of different things. But in the grand scheme of things, he was still an exile. You know, he was still kind of a second-class citizen. Very often, we can forget that God wants to use us in the big picture because all we're looking at is us. We don't see his glory. We don't see the team. We don't see the big picture. What big picture plan does God have for you that you've rendered impossible because of your age, because of your gender, because of your financial situation, because of where you live, or because of your knowledge of the Bible? Oh, I don't know enough, and, and I haven't been exposed enough. What big picture plan does God actually have for you that it requires you to have faith in a much bigger God? Do you have a relationship with that bigger God? Or have we rendered him 
to being so small that we don't believe he has any, anything bigger for us than what we already have today. If you don't have that faith, if you don't have that relationship with God, if you've never allowed yourself to be in that close proximity with God, if you've never given your life to God so that he can have his way and be able to use you for his glory, you need to do that. You need to decide that I want more for my life than just to go to work every day and just to accomplish things and bring in material possessions, but I want to have a bigger purpose. I want to have a bigger plan. Do you have a relationship with that God? Have you ever given yourself and made yourself available for that bigger relationship with God? We're going to stand and sing a song here in just a minute, and I invite you, come forward. Allow yourself to learn what it means to be a disciple of Christ, to follow in Jesus' example. Let us as a church, as brothers and sisters, let us teach you what it means to actually follow him. To not just wonder, not just see it from the outside, but see it for yourself. How God can use you in a much bigger way. Please stand as we sing our song of invitation. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's deep. 